Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm David Bird with Reality Reimagine. I'm an award-winning photographer and Photoshop artist that specializes in fantasy composite art. And today we're going to have a beginner-friendly tutorial and showcase of the lighting modifiers that I commonly use for over 20 years in all the work that I have produced. When I started long long ago there was the youtube platform was not as popular as it is today and there was no good resource that would show you what these lighting modifiers look like how they're constructed how they shape light and what that light looks like on a human subject in a lighting controlled environment like a studio so when i had to make those first purchases for lighting modifiers and we didn't have a lot of money back then i was very reluctant to purchase any modifier because i needed that money to count i needed the purchase to be right so i wanted to make the video today and put on the platform to show you what these modifiers are, how they're constructed, the companies that they come from, but most importantly, show you examples of how the light looks on a human subject. And I'm gonna show you two different sets of images for each of the lighting modifiers. And these two different positions of the light are the key positions that I put my main light source in in most of the work that I do. So we'll see image examples where the lighting modifiers are directly in front of the model, raised above and tilted down. Then we'll see examples where that same modifier is brought to camera left, raised up and tilted down. So you can get an idea of how you can use these to not only throw light, but to shape it in different means and needs for your work. Again, this is for the main key lights that I would be using on set. And I'm gonna show you five modifiers that I have used over my 20 years of being a photographer. Now, before we dive in and take a look at all of these, I want to mention that in the description below, is a link to every one of these modifiers that we'll take a look at today. Four of them come from Strobe Pro, which is the company that I purchase most of my modifiers from. I am not sponsored by Strobe Pro. I do not get any kind of revenue kickback whatsoever from those links, but I have bought most of my stuff from them. They are a great company to work with. The products are incredibly durable, I'm very pleased with them. So take a look at that description below and go to Strobe Pro to look for these modifiers. The fifth one comes from bnhphoto.com. They are a fantastic resource for everything that is photography as well as other electronics and computers and all stuff in other fields of art like music and so forth i am not sponsored by them either on the youtube platform with this channel but i have worked with them at photography conventions where i have taught at they have made sure that i have lights and light poles and backdrops they are just a wonderful group of individuals to work with so look to the description below to see the five different links to the modifiers that we'll be going through today. So with that, let's get started by taking a look at a 47 inch Octabox from Strobe Pro. Since this is a beginner friendly tutorial, one of the first things that I wanna talk about is how lighting modifiers shape the light, specifically when it comes to things like hard light and soft light. And I'm gonna explain what those two terms mean here in just a moment. But again, for that beginner, think about this. The light has to travel out of the strobe through the modifier and out its opening to illuminate the subject. If the opening of the modifier is very large, then that's a large surface for a lot of light to escape and travel in all directions very quickly. But if the opening of the modifier is very small, then the light is incredibly focused, which means it's more intense as it comes out being pointed at your subject. Now, yes, of course, the power setting of the strobe itself can come into play in regard to the intensity of the light. The physical position of the light and modifier, how close it is to your subject, also can come into play with the intensity of the light. But it starts with the shape of the modifier. It starts with its size. So to make a really cheesy joke, size does matter when it comes to lighting modifiers in Photoshop. And we're done with the 12 year old humor today. Moist. Anyway, so that's one of the reasons why I wanted you to see this 47 inch Octavox right away, because as you can see, it travels a pretty good distance in length away from the strobe. Now, all of these lighting modifiers we'll look at today, they're being attached to a Godox AD600 strobe. And the original Godox system and some of the pro models of their lighting units use the Bowens mount system. And let me explain what that means. The Bowens mount is essentially the metal plate that attaches to the end of the lighting modifier that makes it possible for the modifier to attach to the strobe. So when you're looking for a lighting modifier, make sure that it has the right plate, or it will also be referred to as a speed ring on how that modifier will attach to your strobe. Because different strobes and brands require different plates to be able to connect them to the unit itself. Now, jumping back really quickly about hard light and soft light, 
hard light and soft light essentially means the shadows. So as we see the shadows on a subject or the shadows behind them, if the shadows are very crisp and defined, that generally is a hard light source. If the shadows are very faint and they don't have a very defined perimeter, then that's a softer light source. That's another reason why I like using the 47 inch Octobox because how far it's traveling away from the strobe means that there's a lot of light and space for, or I'm sorry, space for the light to travel, which makes the light softer. So we're getting those softer shadows. And that's my preferred style when I'm lighting a human subject. Now, taking a look at the front of this, we can see the two panels of diffusion, both the outer panel of diffusion as well as the interior panel of diffusion. These two are essentially blocking the light. So yet another method of control to get that soft light and let it come and play out. Now, you don't have to use either one of these panels of diffusion. You can just put the shell of the Octobox onto your strobe and just throw light straight out of it. And in that regard, the Octobox is very similar to an umbrella. However, using these panels of diffusion, you get that much more control. You get softer quality of light that's going onto the subject. And for me, that's very key in the portrait work that I do, regardless of the genre that I'm photographing or covering in the studio. I also want you to take a look at how this is constructed. There's the silver interior, but the big thing here is that this is essentially a collapsible umbrella. It acts just like an umbrella when you collapse it down. And that is absolutely essential in this modern age of photography. When I started long ago and bought my first modifiers, they were not portable. They were not transportable. They didn't collapse down very easily. They were hard metal plates with very rigid poles that would take the shape of the material for the modifier. And if you needed to take that modifier with you on location, you didn't want to tear it down because it took a long time to tear it down and put it back together. So you would just try to shove it into your car or put it on an airplane or ship it and then go with it and have to carry it as it's completely assembled out into the field and work with it. Having modifiers that can be collapsed down and put into a little carrying bag or a travel bag is wonderful. So I highly recommend that you look for modifiers that are easily transportable. That's one of the things that I love about the modifiers from Strobe Pro. Not only is the material of the modifier itself incredibly durable and strong, the bag that they come in is incredibly durable and strong. And I know that may seem like a very minor thing, like why is he gushing about the bag? But modifiers that I've purchased in the past, the bag is the cheapest material I've ever seen. And when I'm carrying it over my shoulder with the straps and I'm walking on location with a client and the straps literally rip off because the material is that cheap, it's embarrassing. And in my opinion, it reflects upon me and my brand. And I simply don't want that. So the modifiers from Strobe Pro, they're financially affordable. They're incredibly durable. The bags are durable. They're very easily able to be transported. I love working with these modifiers, especially in this modern age. So the Octobox is kind of my go-to, both from Strobe Pro and the Octobox shape itself. And why is the Octobox important to me? Well, it gets us closer to a circular shape for this lighting modifier. And to me, that mimics natural light, like the sun or a light bulb. When I started long ago, I used to use squares and rectangle modifiers. I had a four foot by six foot rectangular lighting modifier that was a massive light source and it was wonderful to work with. But in my opinion, it just, the light didn't feel natural. And yes, it can be argued it's difficult to look at a picture of a human subject and see the light on them and go, that came from a square, not a rectangle. That didn't come from a circle. Yes, it's hard to see that. But if you look at the catch lights in their eyes, you'll be able to see that. Now that wasn't the deciding factor for me. I just felt as an artist that when I looked at the light and how it would play out on the subject from a rectangle versus a circle, the circle worked better for me. And I just liked that overall flow of light. So th all of those reasons, everything we've just discussed, the, the soft light, the circular shape, the transportability of the modifier, its durability, the Bowman's mount, all that good stuff. That's why I use this 47 inch Octobox for a majority of my work as my main light on set. I will use other lighting modifiers, specifically some of those that we're gonna to continue to look at in this tutorial, but I use that Octobox most of the time as my main light source. So let's dive into Photoshop now and take a look at two different images, seeing those lighting patterns and how the Octobox throws light onto a human subject.
Introductions, as always, to get us started. This is my wonderful friend, Danielle. You've seen her in several videos here on the channel. If you'd like to see more of her amazing artwork, visit the Instagram account at the link below. I also want to give a special thanks to Danielle because I'm sure she's going to watch this video. Danielle, you're like a sister to me, and thank you so much for going with me on these shenanigans where I call you up and I'm like, hey, do you want to come to the studio and be on a YouTube video? And she's like, yeah, sure. And we've worked together on a lot of different projects, and I really enjoy your friendship. So thank you so much for being a part of this. And on behalf of all the folks who watch this video on the YouTube, I'm sure they thank you as well. So this first image is with the Octobox positioned in front of her, brought above her and tilted down. Now that key pattern of bringing it up and tilting it down helps to create some of these shadows we see underneath her jawline and underneath her nose. That's one of the reasons why I like to position that light above her. Now the settings for the camera was f8, ISO 100, and a shutter speed of 1 1 60th of a second. I was also using the Canon EOS R with an RF 24-70 f2.8 lens. Those settings for the camera are what I would typically go to when I start working with any client in the studio, when I'm just doing basic portrait work. If I'm doing heavy storytelling driven work like fantasy composite artwork, I will change the settings depending upon the story and the elements we're trying to create. But when I'm looking to do just standard portrait lighting, those are the settings that I put into my camera and start from there. And I generally start with the light in front of the subject, brought above and tilted down so we can get those sculpting shadows that we see in this scene. So let's take a look at the second image and see how the light comes into play from the Octobox traveling across her body now because the Octobox is off camera left, brought above and tilted down traveling across. So we get these shadows on this side, a little bit of the sculpt and shadows here. So we have brightness and then shadow. This gives us just a little bit more of that dramatic definition in the lighting pattern. And that's why I prefer to put the unit, the lighting modifier off to camera left and bring it up and tilted down. Now, whether it's off camera left or camera right is irrelevant. I just always positioned it to the left and I got stuck with that a long time ago and it's very difficult for me to change it to the right but I will sometimes do that depending upon things like the shape of the clothing they're wearing, the part in their hair and so forth. Last thing that I want to point out in this image is let's look at those catch lights in case you're new. Again, this is beginner friendly content. These are catch lights where we see the reflection of the lighting modifier in their eyes. So you can clearly see the octagon shape of this. So again, if you're trying to dissect the lighting in an image that you like from another artist, zoom into the person's eyes and see if you can see these catch lights. And oftentimes, not only will you see the catch light, you'll see the reflection of the photographer in the pupil of the subject. And depending upon the modifier itself and how big it is, you can see the photographer standing in front of it, as we'll see here in just a moment when we take a look at the parabolic umbrella. So that soft light, those shadows, the shadows are not hard and defined. There are a very general soft shadow to it. This is why I like using that Octobox, because it just gives me that dramatic quality of light that's soft, that helps me to tell the story, and it's just one of my favorite go-tos. But now let's look at the next lighting modifier that I love to use on a regular basis when I'm doing things like corporate headshots and doing beauty work where I'm going to be zooming in and being close to the subject's face and not necessarily doing waist up or even full body shots. And that lighting modifier is a beauty dish. So the first thing to note with this 33 inch beauty dish is that it's significantly smaller in size and width than the 47 inch Octobox from Strobe Pro. So that ultimately when the light travels out of this because it is a smaller opening and because it isn't as wide, the light's gonna be more intense. We're gonna get closer to those harder shadows on the subject. Now, of course, the position of the light to the subject as well as the intensity of the strobe itself come into play, but the circular opening does play into this, the less width and so forth plays into that quality of light. It is a natural circle, so I do like that natural light look with this, but that isn't the only thing that gives a beauty dish its namesake with the light and the quality of light that comes out of it. As we pull this diffusion panel back and take a look at this plate that I'm removing right now, that plate is what makes a beauty dish a beauty dish. So when the light fires, all of the light hits the inside of that plate, then immediately bounces to the back side of the modifier, wraps around and travels out through the opening. You would think that with all of that travel of the light, that ultimately it would act like the interior diffusion panel that we saw in the Octobox, thus making the light a little bit softer. It doesn't. I don't know why. I don't know the physics of it, the mathematics of it. I'm an artist. I'm not a scientist. But the light is more intense because it's hitting that plate and traveling outward. Now, with this unit, 
you do have the ability to use an inner panel of diffusion, just like we saw with the Octavox. It is not attached in this unit because I very typically want to use that inner panel. When I choose to use the beauty dish, I want that harder light. I want that stronger light source. You can also purchase an accessory for this called a grid. A grid is essentially a system of grid a grid system of little squares and it's a very flexible piece of material that uses velcro to attach to the modifier itself and that grid really focuses the light down and focuses it toward the subject making it much much stronger but also it doesn't play out it doesn't hit the backdrop as much it doesn't hit most of their body because it's being focused onto the subject so that grid is an accessory that you can purchase from stroke pro if you do want to get the beauty dish the interior panel of diffusion does come with the beauty dish itself as well as the plate and everything that you see and that bowen's mount so now let's take a look at some images in photoshop and see the quality of light and see a comparison between the Octavox and the Beauty Dish and how those two different light sources look on the same image. So the first thing to note is that the intensity of the light is significantly stronger than what we saw coming from the Octabox. And again, we're gonna see a side-by-side -side comparison here in just a moment. But the light is a little bit stronger. The power settings, everything is still metered at F8, ISO 100, and a shutter speed of 1 1 60th of a second. So this is the overall quality of it. The shadows are just a little bit stronger down here. They aren't super crisp and defined, and that is possible to get in photography, where we will see hard shadows not only on the subject, but a hard shadow behind them on the background. But we're not seeing that with this beauty dish right now because of its position, because of its intensity and the overall shape of it and so forth. Let's look at the side comparison again. That intensity of light is much brighter. We're still getting the shadows on this side of the face. It would be the same whether the beauty dish was off camera left or right. This is the overall quality of it. Let's look at those catch lights real quick just so we can see the circular shape here so that you know that it's a beauty dish. You can't tell that I'm standing in front of her yet, but you'll be able to see that here in just a moment. However, let's look at this side-by-side -side comparison. No changes have been made to these images in Photoshop. It didn't process anything. These are straight out of camera. But with the Octabox, look how soft the intensity of the light is on Danielle's face versus with the beauty dish. Now, both of these are the image examples where the light is in front of her, brought above her, and then tilted down. So that beauty dish, you can see it's much more intense. It's much more powerful. And I do want to make a quick comment just for anybody, again, because this is beginner-friendly content and a tutorial. Yes, both of these images are fully illuminated. So you may look at this and go, well, they look pretty much the same to me, and that's fine if that's what you see. But if you take some time to really notice this, the intensity of the light is significantly different between the Octabox and the Beauty Dish. And that comes into play when you're expected to photograph something like beauty portraits or headshots versus standard portraiture or more artistic work that you may do. The intensity of the light the shape of the light, the softness of the shadows, the hardness of the shadows, all of those are factors that go into the different genres of photography, which is why it's important to understand what these modifiers do so you can make the right purchases when you go to get your first one. So let's move on now to take a look at the third modifier that I like to use, which is a parabolic umbrella. So a parabolic umbrella is quite large. The diameter of this from side to side is seven feet it's 84 inches or something like that it's it's huge but the overall width of it compared to the octabox very very different this parabolic umbrella is just literally an umbrella and it has a panel of diffusion that goes over the outside but how it attaches to the strobe and how we work with it is what makes it a little bit different and more interesting to work with. Essentially, the entire strobe fits inside the modifier. So as you can see, I'm opening up the diffusion right now and you can see the strobe. Now you can attach this diffusion right to the edge of the strobe itself and then just use the draw ties to make it tight. I just put the whole unit inside. Um, if I change the intensity and the power setting of the strobe and run it at 1-1 one, one power so it's at full power, yes, there could be a lot of heat that could continue to build up inside of the modifier. And with the heat being trapped inside with the strobe itself, the fan in the strobe may not be able to keep up and that can drain your battery. That can cause the unit to overheat and so forth. So if you are using a parabolic umbrella outside and it's incredibly hot outside, then make sure that you attach that material to the edge of the strobe so that there is escape air for the fan that is built inside the Godox 8600. The parabolic umbrella is so versatile because it is such a big light source. 
if you change that power setting in the strobe and make it full power, you're going to see a lot of bright light that is very intense and will help to create some of those harder shadows. You're gonna get the super crisp, hard defined shadows? Most likely not. I use the parabolic umbrella as a fill light. And again, because this is beginner friendly content, that fill light is essentially the second light source that I would use on set. So I would have something like the Octobox as my main light source, and then have the parabolic umbrella as the second light that is gently filling in the shadows. So if the Octobox is positioned off camera left, all of those shadows that I'm sculpting on the left side of Danielle's face or camera right, I would fill those in just a little bit with the parabolic umbrella. Why would you wanna fill in shadows if you went out of your way to create them by the lighting pattern? Because sometimes those shadows are too intense. It changes the look of the entire image and the feeling of it. If we fill those shadows just a touch, depending upon the position of the lighting, depending upon the position of the model, your position as you're photographing them, those shadows can be lifted just a little bit and it will change the nature of the image itself. So Parabolics, they're wonderful to use. They have a lot of versatility to them. Let's dive into Photoshop and take a look at how they actually look throwing light onto Danielle. So this is a very general wash of light. Even though the parabolic has been positioned in front of her, raised up a little bit and tilted down as much as possible, we're still getting that general wash of light. We're getting just a, a little bit of a shadow here, but this is more typical of what we would call flat lighting, where there's just really no major sculpt to the light. And that's ultimately why I choose to use the parabolic umbrella as a fill light instead of my main light source. Now I have used the parabolic in the the past as a main light source when I'm doing very storytelling driven, very heavy artistic fantasy work, I'll put the parabolic above the subject and boom it above them and have them look up into it, holding swords and calling out to the heavens and all these kinds of things because that general flat lighting, that big light source gives a lot of opportunity for the subject to play in that light and help to create story and shape and pose. But when we're looking at just basic portraiture, something like a beauty portrait, portrait or high school senior portrait, a bridal portrait, using a parabolic umbrella as your main, I would not recommend. I would recommend using the parabolic as a fill light for some of the shadows, again, depending upon your favorite lighting patterns. Let's also zoom in real quick so that we can see the catch lights with that big circle. And of course, there I am and you can see me in those catch lights. So catch lights, as you're dissecting other people's work and so forth, take a look at those catch lights. You'll be able to see the shape of the modifier and sometimes the photographer themselves. Now let's look at the other image example here. And I do wanna point out that I metered all of these lights to be F8, ISO 100, and a shutter speed of 1 160th of a second. So this is correct. It is metered that way. This is what I was talking about. Depending upon the position of the light unit itself and the modifier and how close it is to the subject, or it's its overall pattern of where it's being thrown can change the intensity. This looks like the unit, the strobe itself, was powered up a little bit more or the camera settings changed. They weren't. It metered at F8 off of her right shoulder, which is where I set the light meter to be when I tested it. And this is just a testament to, again, how that pattern can change, how the shape and the, the quality of light can change. Because it's off camera left, we are getting more shadows on this side of her face, but we're still getting that general wash of light because there's so much light that it's wrapping around and it's a little bit less intense of those shadows. The reason why I use it as a fill light. Now let's take a look at the three different light sources we've talked about thus far and see these examples. All three of these, the lights are positioned in front of them, raised above and tilted down. The Octobox is Ultimately, the most sculpted light. We have the wonderful shadows here. We get the most sculpt of it. The beauty dish is more intense onto her face. The shadows are a little bit more intense and strong. And we have this general wash of light from the parabolic umbrella. So I would say the parabolic is actually the softest light that we see in these three different examples, not the Octobox. But because it's such a large surface area, it's very difficult to sculpt the light as we can do with that 47 inch Octobox from Strobe Pro. So these are the three different examples and now we do need to move into the fourth one and I have to apologize. We only have four lighting modifiers to look at today, not five. Initially on set, I recorded a fifth one, decided now I'm not gonna look at that one because it's, yeah, we'll do it at a later time or whatever else. And I'm a new dad and my son is two and a half months old and I'm very tired. So what do you want from me? We're only looking at four, not five. The fifth one's a mystery, like the dum-dums. You don't know when you unwrap the mystery one if it's butterscotch, root beer, cherry, or just that crappy pineapple one. So anyway, 
Let's take a look at the fourth and final lot modifier. The original, the classic, the go-to that everybody always has, a basic umbrella. The umbrella is such a wonderful, just simple tool to have because again, it's one of the basic things that anybody has ever used when you start with photography, you probably started with an umbrella. Now, this particular umbrella, again, is attaching to the unit in the same way that we saw with the parabolic and ultimately it needs to attach to the front. But I do wanna point out that this umbrella is essentially two umbrellas in one. So with the way it's attached, where we're seeing the strobe firing into it, the strobe is gonna throw all the light into the umbrella and then throw it back out to the subject so that we're getting some of that fall off of light how close the umbrella is to the strobe. If we move the umbrella so it's almost touching the bulb, then it's going to throw the most light because the surface that the light is bouncing off of is very, very close to the bulb itself. If we pull the umbrella further back, then there's a lot of space for that light to spill out and not hit the umbrella and then bounce onto the subject. But since this is a two-in-one umbrella, I can take the black material off and we will just have the white material. And this is called a shoot-through umbrella, where instead of positioning the light where the light would be bounced into the umbrella and out, we would actually shoot right through it it still attaches to the strobe in the same way but we want the light to travel through it and the umbrella becomes essentially just a panel of diffusion similar to what we've seen in the other units we've looked at today so when you do get an umbrella if you do then make sure you get an umbrella that is an appropriate size and if you can get one that is a double umbrella that has the black outer material so that the light is trapped and it will throw outward and travel toward the subject or you can get the white material or even some a white silvery material that's translucent enough that light can pass through it, then you have two different ways to use the umbrella to throw light onto subjects. Let's dive into Photoshop and take a look at the final image set and get a comparison of all of these modifiers together. So as we can see, we're getting a general wash of light similar to the parabolic umbrella, but this quality of light and the shadows is mimicking the Octabox. This is why I like having an umbrella and why I would recommend that you have an umbrella in your kit because it's the cheapest modifier to purchase. It's one of the most basic modifiers you can have. It was the first modifier I bought long ago and we get a good quality to the lighting for portrait work. We get good control and sculpting of the light, good shadows, and a good wash of light coming from the demodifier onto the subject. Now seeing this side view, we can see that the light is a little bit more intense and these shadows are much stronger. Why are the shadows stronger? Because there is no panel of diffusion that the light has to travel through. The other three modifiers we looked at, they all have some sort of panel of diffusion that diffuses that light and makes it softer. The umbrella is just literally a physical object that the light is hitting, bouncing off of and coming right to the subject. Yes, there is a little bit of fall off of light because of that travel that it has to do, but it's not passing through anything. So we get that stronger bare bulb intensity to the light and we're getting those stronger shadows. So this is where an umbrella and a parabolic umbrella can come into play. We use a parabolic umbrella as a soft light source off camera right to fill in some of these shadows so they aren't as intense. You can use the beauty dish to do that. You can use the Octabox. You can use any light modifier to fill those shadows. It just depends on its shape, its quality, how it throws the light, and all that kind of stuff that will come into play. But let's look at the final image now and see this example comparison of all four of these light modifiers. The Octavox, again, being my favorite here, this is the one that I prefer to use, but look at the overall intensity of light on Danielle's face for this Octabox, and then look at it from the umbrella. This light coming from the umbrella is a little more crisp. It's a little stronger. It's not as flat as we can see from the parabolic. It isn't as hot and as intense from the beauty dish. We're getting a good general wash of light. Again, one more time, this is why I recommend get an umbrella. They're the most affordable. They give you a wonderful throw of light and it's a great thing to start with. And if you get that double umbrella, you'll have two different ways to use it and you'll have some wonderful looks that you can produce from it. So. Seeing these four examples together, one, I hope that you have the opportunity to be able to make the right decisions about what you want to purchase first, but I hope this gives you, especially the beginners, a better understanding of why we use the modifiers, how the light is thrown and what we do with it and what's possible to do with not only one of the modifiers, but multiple modifiers together on set to be able to create some wonderful lighting patterns and some great artwork.
Let's finish up this video today with some final thoughts. Final thoughts, I wanna go back to the beginning of my career and talking about spending money. When we started, I would find an artist that was uh, inspirational to me and I would see their work. And then if I got the fortune to hear them speak at a conference or to learn from them in a magazine article and they would mention gear, I would wanna run out and buy that gear immediately and say, well, if so-and-so is using that gear, that's the gear that I'm going to purchase. And that's how I defined my level of comfortability and spending the limited resources we had when we started our business. I want to encourage you to not do that and go with me on this because I know it sounds like, well, hey dude, I just watched this entire video. You're giving me recommendations of what I should buy. Now you're telling me I shouldn't listen to you. I'm telling you to not run out and buy the things that I use just because I use them. I want you to see these examples. I need you to see these examples because I want you to spend your resources wisely. I want you to buy a lighting modifier that you love, that's wonderfully produced, is durable, is gonna last for the ages, gonna give you the artwork that you want so that you will have it with you for years and years and years. It will be your trusted companion in your photography journey. And making those decisions and spending those dollars is even more rewarding when it's done right and you're getting the right thing. So. Yes, take the time to find out what other artists use and be inspired by that. And if you wanna purchase it, go ahead. It's your money, it's your life and your business. But I strongly encourage you to understand why it works. Is it something you want to use? Is it going to work with the current genres of photography that you cover? Are you ready to step into something new and try new things, experimental lighting patterns and so forth? And then these modifiers and uh, the things we've covered today can help you out with that. That's the end of the video for today. If you like the content you found in this video, please give the video a like and consider subscribing to the channel because new content debuts each week in photography and Photoshop education. And when you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell icon so you be notified of that content when you return to the YouTubes. Thanks for watching today and until next time, I'll see you out there in the world of Photoshop.